So hello and welcome. I'm Dale Jarvis. I'm the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer with Heritage NL. And today we're having a chat with Jordan. Jordan, thanks for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Where are you joining in from? Uh, I'm in St. John's right now. I just moved into a new place. <laughs> so <laughs> still unpacking, as you can see. <laughs> so give us, a, give us a little bit of an introduction. Uh, who are you and, and, well, how do we know each other? That might be an interesting place to start, too. For sure, yeah. So it was a couple of years ago. I was actually still in uh, high school at the time, uh, 12th grade. Um, you produced a mummer's plane and, yeah. and with Tim, Tim Matson directed uh, with um, Max uh, at the time. Uh, and I played King George. So that's how we met. Um, and now I'm uh, actually living in Toronto, um, studying uh, theater production at Ryerson University, uh, right downtown. I'm going to my fourth year now, um, but now I'm I'm home, uh, spending time with my family during uh, during the the pandemic. Yeah, so I know I know you've kind of had an interesting last couple of months. Um, we've all had an interesting last couple of months <laughs> for sure. So so where were you when you started to uh, to get a sense that this was a little bit out of the ordinary? So uh, th this semester, this past semester, was a little different for me. Um, I was put on a show at school as a production manager for um, what we call the New Voices Festival. So it's essentially a fringe festival um, where all, uh, all the shows uh, were written by um, the fourth year students at Ryerson. Um, so I had the opportunity to stage manage, uh, or to sorry, production manage. Uh, so I tried something new. Um, so about two weeks, a week before we opened, uh, there was uh, some, murmurs around that, that school was going to close and, and, and we didn't uh, know what was to come of this show. Um, but we kept working until the last day, last hour, and, and, and then school shut down. So um, it kind of took us by surprise. We were hearing about this pandemic uh, as everyone was. Um, uh, it was all happening outside of North America. And then um, all at once, it just seemed to come up and, and, and everything shut down. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the show uh, obviously had to take a completely different turn and, and, and move online then. Um, so luckily all our hard work didn't uh, go for nothing, so people were still able to um, view the show online, but uh, not uh, at the, in the capacity that it was, it was supposed to be. So when did you, when did school shut down for you? Um, Mid-March. Yeah. Uh, so we were supposed to open March 30th, so yeah, I, I guess a, a week before that. Um, and maybe two weeks before that is when school shut down. So yeah. there's about a month left of the semester. So we're almost there, but yeah. Yeah, here I remember the week that we shut down. I had gone to see uh, La Cage au Fall had opened at the Arts and Culture Center here, and I had we had tickets for opening night. And I remember sitting there, and and I ended up sit like it's St. John's, so I ended up sitting next to someone I know, of course. and we were chatting. And we're like, oh yeah, like we were both kind of we didn't know how many people would be here tonight and then within a day uh everything kind of got shut down the friday yeah. night um uh, we were involved with a gallery opening at the the craft council and and the same thing people kind of showed up uh, but yeah. then there was debate about whether or not it was actually going to go ahead and then everything got shut down the casual fall got shut yeah. down after putting all that work uh, into it uh, so what was that transition like for you having to go first of all you had to you had to leave you had to i did leave yeah <laughs> yeah i thought, thought it'd be a lot home. safer to, to to be in st john's than in, in toronto um and i was also supposed to be going on tour this summer with uh, no change in the weather uh, a new Newfoundland musical that um, I toured with them last summer and they hired me back this year. So uh, we were supposed to be open now at the Arts and Culture Center, unfortunately, then doing a short Newfoundland tour before we uh, hit the rest of the country. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was a big transition try, trying to like finish up at school, which the semester then was extended to give us more time to transition into this online semester. And then uh, still waiting to hear from No Change. We haven't uh, officially um, shut it down yet. So hopefully it just postponed until uh, the end of the year. Uh, but yeah, I, I honestly still transitioning. It's uh, new, new things popping up all the time and uh, it's trying to uh, find new ways to occupy my time and keep busy and, and still create art, so. How, how much time was there between uh, school kind of shutting down and you getting on a plane? Like how, how quick uh, it was, was, uh, it? It, was a, it was a decision I was, I was trying to make for, I'd say a week, a week and a half. Um, 
be, be, when, when school shut down, I was uh, working at a part-time job just uh, throughout school and that, that stayed open for uh, four or five days after school closed. So I had to wait to hear from them uh, before I came home. Um, but I, I'd say it was a, a, a week or two decision before I, I decided to bite the bullet and get a plane ticket. And um, what, was that, what was that flight like coming back? What was the airport like in that whole? Yeah, I tried. I was uh, trying to steer clear of Pearson Airport just because it's so big. And I, I was looking at flights from Billy Bishop, um, but they were just so expensive leaving from Billy Bishop. So I, I decided to go to Pearson. Um, I kind of assumed it, there wouldn't be many people on the plane or they would kind of have us separated and no one sitting next to each other. But the plane was completely packed. It was a, <laughs> it was like a 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. flight. Um, and uh, everyone was wearing masks. I had a big thing of Lysol wipes. I sat down in my chair and it was like soaking wet from <laughs> me rubbing it down. Um, it was a pretty stressful flight just because everything was uh, uh, just coming out and, and, and we didn't really know how to uh, keep ourselves safe then. Um, now that we're kind of being used to what we know to, to wear these masks and, and, and to have all this hand sanitizer. But uh, I was very uh, stressed out on that flight. Um, and then to come home and have to quarantine myself for 14 days by myself, um, uh, that, that was uh, very stressful. It was, it, it was kind of hard to stay sane during those 14 days by myself. But Yeah. I think yeah. one of the, the first the first sense I had that something was really different, I, I had been in British Columbia during reading break. So that would be mid February. And I remember flying out and no big deal. And then on the way back, like a kind of a few days, not even a week, but a few days later, um, I had never seen so many people at the Toronto airport, like staff, like wearing masks or wearing latex gloves. And I thought, oh, like this is different. Like the airport yeah. has changed. So even like, and then so you would have gotten on a plane like a few weeks after that. So I can only imagine what the airport must have felt like. Like Very stressful, yeah. How were, how were people kind of interacting or were people social distancing then? Was, did people <laughs> know were. what that word, did that people know what that word meant or? Yeah, luckily um, they, they had uh, like lines on the, on the ground kind of dividing us. Um, most people were... Um, kind of distance themselves. But once I got through the security line, it, I, I felt like just people were all around me, like no one was keeping that six feet of distance, but uh, everyone seemed to be wearing a mask. And uh, I did feel kind of safe seeing all that and, and, and I'm trying to implement those precautions uh, with the lines on the, on the ground. But um, yeah, just because some people weren't um, kind of following the rules, it, it, it was pretty stressful. Yeah, that's like just going to the grocery store now. I find it the same way. Exactly. <laughs> There's yeah, always I, I, was there, I was there this morning and it was just, I, there was people passing me and going down the wrong ways in the aisles. And yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the, the lines, the arrows in the grocery store completely seem to boggle the minds of some people. I, I, it, I just I, don't get it. I, they don't get it. I don't know what's difficult about it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just something that some people either don't care about or just can't wrap their heads around that all of a sudden yeah. there are rules. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're lucky here in, in, in Newfoundland that there's, there's not as many cases as there is in Ontario or Quebec. Um, I, I, I'm definitely glad I'm here because being in the grocery store in Toronto would just be, chaotic, I'm sure. Uh, and I keep seeing pictures of people like in Hyde Park and uh, they're just all around, there's hundreds of people around and, and no one's really keeping their distance. So uh, we are lucky here that there, are, there aren't many cases. Mm. So when you shifted your, uh, your theater stuff from school online, uh, how did that work? How, what, what did you have to do? There was a, there was a long process of uh, the upper management team and, the, and then the professors who I guess were considered the producers of the show. Uh, where we we tried to figure out how we were going to go about it, who was going to design this website, uh, what they were going to put on the website. Um, so it, it took us about, I'd say, two weeks to kind of compile all the information before we met with the the um, student producers, the student directors. Um, but we, we finally decided to uh, allow them to kind of put whatever they wanted on the website that uh, would, would show patrons what their show is. Um, some shows were lucky enough to have been far enough in the rehearsal process that they had recorded a full run through, so they were able to put that on their on their website. Um, whereas some uh, maybe just had pictures or designs. Uh, we brought in the production students as well, who were uh, costume designing and set designing, 
props designing. So there was lots of really cool designs uh, on the website. Um, and then we also did a um, two hour live stream where, which gave every producer about a 10 minute time to do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, so, so some people um, did kind of read throughs of certain scenes or some people did Q and A's. Uh, and, and some people just did slideshows of, of just all, all their designs. Um, so that was super interesting. Um, uh, and and we, we were able to kind of advertise through that website, uh, the, the websites for the individual shows, because I know these students want to pursue these um, shows outside of a, a school setting for sure. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a weird process, but we were able to hire on a, um, a web designer who made our website look, look beautiful. Um, and very user friendly. So it, it turned out great. Unfortunately, we obviously weren't able to perform the full shows and we were, we were almost there, but it took us some time to transition, but we did figure it out. Right. And is that still up and running now, that website? It is. So, so you can check us out at uh, newvoicesfestival.com. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is a kind of an interesting thing because normally you wouldn't have that kind of uh, artifact that was created out of that exactly. process. Exactly. Yeah. It's we we were we were lucky when uh, talking to the professors. They've they've decided to um, they're going to recycle this website after year after year because this is a festival they do every year. Um, so they, they'll put on new work again this time next year uh, for the for the students going to fourth year now. Um, so it's given the, the school a lot of ideas and and helped us um, uh, take our school and and put it online. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting that the technical director of my program said that they have this massive binder full of um, uh, second plans, I guess, in case something happens. So if there was a hurricane or a flooding or anything like that, he said the only thing they didn't have was a worldwide pandemic. So <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole new chapter for that book now. Yeah, exactly. So now we're prepared <laughs> for the next time. <laughs> and have you, been, have you been in contact with your fellow students since you've been uh, kind of home and done? What are, what, are, what are their responses? What are they up to? Yeah, we have a, a, a lot of students in my program are from Toronto, so uh, they, there wasn't that huge transition uh, of um, uh, having to move back to where they're from. But there was a couple of us. There's, there's people there from the Yukon and uh, from Chile, just from all over. Um, so I have been keeping in contact with them um, a bit, and, and everyone's kind of transitioning. Um, we just found out that in September our, our classes are going to be online as well. So um, we, we've been talking about that. And I'm also going to my fourth year. So I uh, have been working on my thesis project, which I have um, uh, brought on. I think there's 15 of us, uh, 15 Ryerson students um, in my program who are going to be working on this, uh, this project that I'm doing. So um, I've been keeping in contact with them daily, just uh, and, and talking about school, trying to keep us, ourselves busy and again, create more uh, art and content. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your your 14 day quarantine. Uh, <laughs> what were you What were you like at the beginning, and what were you like at the end? It was. Uh, I was my my parents actually. I stayed at my parents' house, but they decided to go out to their cabin in Brigus for um, 14 <laughs> days. So I was completely by myself. Um, I was lucky enough they stocked up the fridge for me and, and and did all that, so I had enough to eat. But I found it so impossible to stay motivated and and, and do nothing. But um, at that time, I was still in school, so I, I did have that to keep me motivated and to finish up some of my classwork. Um, and, and again, I was working on this New Voices Festival, so I was on Zoom every day. Um, so that keep, kept me occupied, but uh, after that, after like 5 p.m. every day, I was just, there was nothing. <laughs> lots, of, <laughs> lots of drinking and FaceTiming with my friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now... Uh this conversation that we're having all came about because you had reached out to me about your thesis project. So right. um, are you going to be staying in Newfoundland then in September? And uh, are you, it's is that tough an call. uncertain? Yeah. 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 No, it's a tough call. Um, my program is so hands-on and uh, a lot of the work we do is, is impossible to do online. Um, so we haven't really heard what this semester is going to be yet, whether the school is going to be entirely closed with no access to the building at all. Um, or if we're going to be able to meet in, in small groups of five or ten um, in September, which I, I think we will be able to. So I have yet to decide if I'm going to stay here, if I'm going to go back up there. Um, again, with with no change, as Toro is supposed to go on, I might uh, have to stay here for rehearsals while I'm in school online in September. So 
it's all still up in the air, playing yeah. it by ear. Yeah. No one knows what we're doing next week. Like <laughs> no one exactly tomorrow yeah. even. <laughs> yeah. So then tell us a little bit about the the thesis. First of all, maybe before we get right into the thesis project, explain the program at Ryerson. Like how is it how is it structured? Sure. So there there are three streams in in the um uh performance program at Ryerson. Uh, there is a dance stream, an acting stream, and a production design stream. So I'm in the production and design stream. Uh, we, we learn everything about production, whether it be the stage management or any upper management, uh, technical direction, uh, design, we have costumes, set design, carpentry. Um, so it's, it's, it's very uh, well-rounded. Um, we do, I think it's eight shows every year. So for a semester, um, two or three dance shows and the rest are acting shows. Um, so we have a couple of classes with the with all three streams together, but normally we're all kind of separated until we have to come together and, and do a show. So every semester we're assigned a, a role from our professors on what show we're going to work on. So like last semester I was the production manager on this new Voices Festival, whereas the semester before I was a stage manager. Um, so you kind of get to pick what you kind of want to do and what you want to focus on, but you have the opportunity to do everything. So. Um, in in uh, the the winter semester coming up, I I'm signed up to do like a welding course, which is uh, totally outside of my comfort yeah, zone. Cool. I'm, I'm a management, yeah. So I, <laughs> I, I I love paperwork. I love sitting behind my computer and doing that. So I'm excited to do some hands-on things because um, I haven't done anything like that since my first semester, where we kind of did an umbrella course where we we, we learned little bits about everything. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot going on at Ryerson. It's a very well-rounded program. Uh, I'm really lucky and excited that I'm in it, for sure. And so then really the thesis- excited to be almost done. <laughs> right, yeah. So then the thesis project, um, how, does that, how does that work for, over the next, when is that due, when, when do you start? So I came up with this idea, honestly, when we did the Mummers play in, I think it was 2013. Um, and, uh, and then in my, theater uh, Canadian history class in my second year at Ryerson, we learned about um, Mummer's plays and, and Sir Humphrey Gilbert and um, it just uh, early theater in Canada. Uh, so I got this idea to, uh, at, the, at the end of the, my end of this program to um, do my, my thesis project on uh, Newfoundland and, and specifically on Mummer's plays um, and the history of, of those. Um, the thesis project can literally be anything. It's an independent study. Uh, it, you can, it can just be a paper. It can be literally anything you want. So I've decided to kind of go above and beyond and, and produce a full on show in Toronto and kind of uh, showcase my, my Newfoundland heritage and, mm. um, and, and uh, introduce Torontonians to, to what mummers are. Um, so I'm excited and I, I'm lucky enough because I, I need so many roles and people involved in this show that other people have decided to take on this project as their thesis too. So uh, my, my props designer is um, doing a research topic on, on uh, hobby horses and, and on ugly sticks. So whereas mine is more about the history of mummering in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll have to have a chat with the hobby horse person at some point because that's a passion sure, of mine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so for for people who are who might be watching this uh, and aren't from Newfoundland or watching it in the future and aren't sure what a mummer's play is, can you can you give us a description? For sure. So I'm uh, focusing the new Newfoundland mummering. Uh, a lot of the traditions come from the UK form of mummering, specifically in England. Um, uh, it, to, to my knowledge, it was first introduced here the, um, by Sir Humphrey Gilbert, which uh, is, uh, who founded Newfoundland in, in, in the uh, 1500s. Um, uh, mummering is a tradition that I guess started in Newfoundland from these plays where uh, you, you dress up in kind of obscene costumes and um, uh, a, lo a lot of the time it will contain a hero and a villain, uh, often King George and um, uh, any sort of villain from, from, from way back when, you know. Um, and it kind of turned into its, this whole other tradition here in Newfoundland, um, a Christmas tradition where you dress up and cover your face and hide your whole persona and go door to door uh, to people you know in your community. Um, you have a big party in your kitchen, they serve food and drink, and you guess who everyone is. Uh, there's, there's lots of song and dance. 
um, involved. So it's, it's, it's a huge tradition in Newfoundland that has uh, so many different ways of, of doing it. And from community to community, everyone seems to have a, a different way of mummering. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting, um, I guess, tradition here. Uh, it's, it's very artistic and, and, and very fun and lively and uh, everyone knows about it. And I, I think it really um, uh, describes uh, or defines who Newfoundlanders are and it, it shows our hospitality and, and we're welcoming anyone into our homes and, and, and we'll, we'll feed them and have fun and entertain them. And um, I think it's a good definition of who Newfoundlanders are for sure. When you, when you uh, studied this and you said in your second year, you talked about uh, mummering plays, um, the students from Toronto, did they, did they know anything about this? Or did they, was it something they were kind of aware of or? It's funny, like I, people in Toronto, at least my friends knew nothing about yeah. uh, mummers or and nothing about Newfoundland really as a, as a whole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't even know where it was, some of them. Yeah. Um, no, they had no idea. And it was interesting because uh, we were talking about the debate that some historians believe that it's the very first uh, theatrical performance in Canada was in Newfoundland and it, it, it uh, revolved around mummering and, and hobby horses and stuff. So that was kind of what we learned about uh, was kind of the first theatrical performance here in Canada. Um, so we didn't necessarily go much into much detail about what a mummer is, um, but uh, and co come next year when that professor's teaching it to um, the upcoming second year classes, she's actually asked me to guest lecture and kind of talk about the history of it. <laughs> there you go. Give, because, because yeah, she's never been to Newfoundland. She uh, only yeah. knows about what she's read, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're the expert. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. That's amazing. Uh, so what is your project then? What are you what are you doing with this idea of mummering plays? For sure. So I want to incorporate many different cultures found uh, in Newfoundland and, and in theater. I want to not only pay homage to my Newfoundland heritage and and perform this traditional new, uh, mummers play, uh, but I also want to pay homage to the uh, Yothic people of Newfoundland, the native people of Newfoundland, um, who were impacted by the uh, early settlers and, 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 and are now extinct. Um, and I, I think the, the Mummers play really um, uh, played a huge impact in, in their extinction. And, and um, uh, yeah, so I want to pay homage to not only Newfoundland and Newfoundland culture, but the native Newfoundlanders. Um, and bringing in all my production elements, I also want, would love to have all these bright colors and kind of incorporate a lot of queer cultures into, in, into this um, uh, show, because I, I think there is a lot of um, queer undertones kind of in my ring. There's a lot of cross-dressing, yeah. Right? A lot <laughs> of cross-dressing. Yeah, a, yeah, exactly. a lot of ambiguity. Yeah, a lot of ambiguity. So I, I kind of want to incorporate all of those three cultures in, in, into one uh, by also telling the story of Newfoundland and our heritage to um, a whole different group of people who may not know anything about it. Yeah. So one of the things that I always find interesting about the Mummers plays is that, a as you said, there's usually a hero and a villain character, but then there's these other kind of stock characters that yeah. get plopped into here, which might seem, um, you know, uh, kind of an unusual assortment of, of characters, but I guess they were, they were the pop culture heroes of the time. So you might have Napoleon kind of make right. a surprise appearance. Do, do you have plans to incorporate kind of a contemporary uh, character in your? I've been trying to these? narrow down a, a couple scripts that I have found um, with all these different characters. Um, I think that I do want to make the, sh the show more contemporary, but mostly using my production elements uh, and, and maybe not my characters uh, or the script um, keep that more traditional. Um, but in the scripts that I found, uh, there, there's um, uh, Father Christmas's characters and there's always a doctor involved. So yeah. when, everyone, when someone gets struck down, uh, the doctor is there with their bag full of goodies or they can do whatever. Um, so I do, I do want to keep that kind of like comedic sense where they have all these random characters that might not even fit into the story at all. I do want to keep that, but, um, but also like tr keeping it uh, traditional at the yeah. same time. Is the doctor going to have like a COVID-19 mask or <laughs> maybe. something, you know, like <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the kind of the interesting things about a tradition is we have this idea sometimes that tradition is a fixed thing that happened in the past, but it's, it really is a way of kind of addressing current issues in For some sure. way. Yeah.
so incorporating that kind of biotic history uh, into it is going to be interesting. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Well. I'm not. I'm not sure uh, exactly how I'm going to do it yet. Um, I, I do plan on calling, kind of telling the story of the biotic people before we um, go into the play, um, using a, a narrator and using um, my projections to kind of. Um, portray this story uh, on, on, in, on the background for people. Um, I know a lot of people uh, outside of Newfoundland don't know who the Biotic people are and yeah. um, have no idea that they're, they're extinct. So um, I do, I do want to tell their story uh, in, in, in some way. Um, and I do want to, my, my costume designer who is also taking this on as her thesis, um, would like to incorporate a lot of uh, Biotic culture into the costumes as well. So I think that's going to be an interesting challenge for her. Um, and it's, it's going to be an interesting challenge for myself to um, tell the story of the Biotic people uh, um, in the right way and, 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 and make sure that I do it right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because I am not a Native person. Um, uh, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, I want to give them kind of a voice. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I find interesting about the Mummers plays is that in, in a way they're very surface and very silly. Yes. Um, but at the same time, like sometimes they are kind of complex. You know, I, I, I know that um, we talked about how they're being a, a hero and a villain uh, in, in the traditional English Mummers plays. Usually that was King George or Saint George and then some kind of other like often it was right. like the Turkish night like it was yes. there was a little bit of Islamophobia that played into that you know so it's always like kind of the darker other and there's this yeah. um you know so it, it it's interesting that you're uh, uh, thinking about ideas of colonialism and what that means in terms of this production and who is the other and who is the who is the villain in that story you know it's know. is is king george the hero in the story or is king george kind of the villain now when we look at it with 21st century eyes i think yeah. that's totally interesting because that's kind of what i want to do and i want to i want to decolonize this whole tradition you know um so in in that sense uh, king george or prince george whoever it may be might be the villain and yeah. in, in his eyes he's not though and he he is uh um uh trying to better himself and and, and better the world but in others eyes and in, in a modern day eye it's not like it's not that at all yeah i'm sure um, the biotic so would have had very strong opinions on who the villain in that story was yeah for sure for sure yeah. I, I found a quote and I, I wish i had it here i don't unfortunately uh, i found a quote from one of the captains from um uh, these early settlers in Newfoundland and they, they call the Biotic people um, savages. They mm -hmm. say uh, they're, they're trying to distract or uh, allure the, 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 these people um, and I would just assume it would be to um, kind of distract them while, while they maybe pillage their village or, or something like that. So, um, but, but also by then making them seem like they are the hero and maybe that was um, what they try to do with this character is show that he is the good guy when realistically what they're doing to these people is, is terrible. Yeah. yeah. One of the other themes I think that the Mummers plays really explore is this idea of resurrection um, and revitalization. You know, there's often a hero or a villain or a combination of the two of them that are killed in the play mm -hmm. and then are reborn in some fashion, which, you know, is also kind of interesting given our current kind of political uh, situation in, in Canada. Like, you know, are we, are we uh, moving towards rebirth of some kind? Even, right. even with all the stuff that's happening now with the, the pandemic, you know, w people are talking about going back to normal, but I think there's kind of an understanding that normal is never really going to be normal no. <laughs> as it was, you know, like there's going, is to an be, illusion. <laughs> there's going to be this kind of new, uh, new way of doing things. And we don't really know what that, what that is yet. But so, yeah, there is kind of a death and a rebirth that um, I think is really an interesting thing that you get to play with. Yeah. with this and I, I, th I think in my opinion, the doctor character is, the, one of the most important because they they kind of do signify that rebirth and a lot of the time they stay neutral and they they, they will help both the hero and the villain and anyone else who got struck down in the play um and i, I do want to put so much importance on that character when i do it because i i, I think that whole undertone of, of resurrection is is um, really important and, and really interesting to explore 
Now, as, as you kind of move forward with this, if people want to get in touch with you or they want to follow what you're doing, do, do you have, uh, uh, do you have social media tags you want to promote sure. <laughs> so they can find so you? Before I moved to Toronto, um, me and St. John's local Stephanie Curran uh, created a production company called Riveting Productions, uh, where uh, we, we aim to educate and also fundraise within our community. Um, so I'm going to use that platform to produce this show. So you can follow us on social media at Riveting Productions on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and all my contact information will be posted there, our, our email and uh, my phone number as well. And we'll, we'll put some of that down here somewhere in the, awesome. in the video <laughs> version. Yeah, great. All right, Jordan, thanks for this. It's been lovely Thank to so catch much. up and have a chat about, you know, obviously something we're both passionate about, mummers and mummering history. It's been a lot I'm of excited. fun. I'm <laughs> excited. Take care. See ya.